Okay. Are we good? Right for your class. Okay. So, right. I don't know. Is that, does that feel fine with the sound? It's gonna. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with sound. There we go. No, no, it's so audio can sync up to video. It's okay. But thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Please clap. All right. So, hi. I'm Ian Zhang. I that's my name right there. Uh, you're here to hear about a little bit about it, designing for experience. Uh, so we're going to break it down a little bit, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself, what I do, and a little bit about how to think about things. How many of you are game designers in this room? I, I see one. That's great. Well, that's fine. So <laughs> uh, the rest of you should be able to learn something about this. All of you at home, I, I don't know who you are, but you're cool for watching this. Thank you. All right. So I am Ian Zhang. I am. I work two jobs. Number one, in, during the day, uh, I work at the Carnegie Science Center up in Pittsburgh as a professional development coordinator. It's a big word, uh, but that's what I do. I teach teachers about cool things, and I guide schools on improving STEM in their area. So a lot of schools are looking to improve science, technology, engineering, and math courses, and we say, hold the phone. Let's step, take a step back and actually figure out how can we forward our learning of the STEM principles rather than just the STEM. So when we say STEM, we actually mean like STEAM, which includes art, or STREAM, which includes reading. At a certain point, you just call it hamster, or school. It's up to you. Uh, that, by the way, that's humanities, arts, music, uh, science, technology, engineering, and reading. They just have fun with it. It's, it at a certain point, we just call it school. That's our kind of tagline. It's fun. All right. So I also, <laughs> during the night, I'm Batman. No. I work as the lead game developer at Deepwater Games, which is, I have a laser. There we go. Deepwater Games. Uh, it's a newer company. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. But I'm working with designers to make their games better so that we can publish them and make them awesome looking, like that one, Sovereign Skies. It's coming out later, way later, next year. It's cool. All right. Oh, I'm going backwards. And I'm a board game advocate. I can't get enough about designing and developing board games, and uh, I think they're the way of the future because everyone is on their phones all the time, and I want everyone to come back together and actually you know, communicate as humans should do, I hope. All right, uh, these are some of the games that I've worked on. Uh, Categorize is actually not available. It's actually a private uh, professional development tool that a company uses in Pittsburgh uh, for their own trainings. It's a category management company. Anyone know? I see one head nodding. Anyone know what that is? OK, just doesn't know. I still don't. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a very, uh, it's basically, this is very expensive. How can we make it less expensive? That is their whole job. They come in and they say, you have all these, you're spending all this money on things you don't need. How can you reduce that? And their trainings were pretty dry. It was hopefully not like mine. Um, here's a white PowerPoint with black text. I'm going to dim the lights. I'm going to talk at you really softly. And I expect you to remember this for the rest of your life. Cool? <laughs> Six hours later, everyone's asleep, and it's great. Uh-oh, no. So I designed a board game for them uh, so that they could actually play and engage with their the people that they're training, and rather than going in and seeing a dry PowerPoint, they actually get to interact with another, other people and actually learn from them, which is pretty cool. Whenever I walk into a room, I, I expect that I am not the smartest person in the room, and that is true right now. Every single one of you has something to bring to a conversation. I don't know what it is yet, but there it, it, there it is. And so if I walk into a group of category management people, I better, I, I'm never going to know as much as them. So let's get them to talk and actually talk things out so they learn from each other. So that's a whole cool thing. Uh, Constellations is my first published game. Haha. -ha. I've worked on a ton of other games. You can go to my website to actually see all of the things that I've developed. But um, that's my first actual thing with my name on it. It's really cool. Uh, and that's the second one, which is coming out May, I think. I think it's May. Question mark? But it's uh, coming out soon. It's an escape room game. Uh, I'll talk about this more, but I developed a whole system where you can do an escape room over and over and over again with the same group, which I'm really excited about. 
I don't think that's done, been done yet, so we'll see what happens. It's more of a puzzle game, but we'll talk about that. So, you came here for designing for experience. It's not about me. Let's actually get to the topic. So, we're going to talk about a model. This model is the IPOP model. It's a very good acronym. Uh, this is developed by James Schreiber. He's at Duquesne now, but he actually worked at the Smithsonian Institute uh, as a researcher, figuring out how to improve museum experiences. Anyone interested in museum work? A couple people, okay. Yeah, so when people are designing exhibits, uh, they often think from their own perspective. What would I like to see? And so the Smithsonian had him actually come up with a model where you could actually see it from multiple different perspectives. So you weren't just looking through the lens of your own eye. And so the four types uh, of experiences that people will prefer are idea, people, object, and physical. Now those are pretty abstract terms, but let's kind of dive into what that means. So, iPod versus I for idea. I know how to PowerPoint. Let's look at this exhibit here. What do you notice? Well, actually, let's just raise your hand. I'm going to call on you. What's the first thing you notice? Someone raised your hand. Oh my gosh. They, yes. <laughs> what? Plaques. Plaques. OK, so you saw these things. And th maybe this. Anyone else? Anyone see something different upon first looking at it? Yes? Just a picture. Just a picture. So you saw this nice big picture of this very handsome looking Lance Shijan. Uh, there we go. Anyone, anything else? Yep. Piece of paper. You saw the piece of paper right here. Yeah. So that was three different answers within 30 seconds. The whole idea is what would an idea type of person look for? Oftentimes, it's the conceptual idea. It's the abstract thinking. Again, I'm good at PowerPoint. And they want to know. So who said the placard? I think it was me. Yeah. So you, your first thing is, I want to look at that placard. I want to know everything on it. You're the person who goes to a museum where you're like, I want to read every single one of these placards. And everyone else around you is like, oh, come on. I want to see all these cool things, right? Right? Yeah, a little bit. You don't want to see everything. All right, that's fine. All right. So again, it's. The, the idea behind this is that they are the people that go to museums to read everything, to absorb as much knowledge through conceptual or abstract thinking. People, 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 people are people, people. They go to museums for emotional connections, communication, and they want to understand. How many of you go to a museum and you either talk the ear off of the person next to you about, oh, what do you think about that thing? I don't know. What's going on? Anyone? Okay, we have one. Thank you, Dr. Wentz. Go to a docent, maybe. Say, like, oh, I have questions about this. Or just go, okay, that's fine. Not everyone is, this is actually, I found to be more of a rare type. How about object? We're going to go back to this. Who said the picture? Who said the book? Anyone see this thing right here? And be like, ooh, what's that? I don't even know what that is. Uh huh. A lot of people are object oriented. <laughs> they want to see things. They go to a museum to look at things and see all the cool things. Wow, that is a wall of gold. I'm going to go look at the wall of gold. Wow, that is a big T Rex. That is a nice T Rex. How many of you are like that? There we go. A lot more hands there. <laughs> So everyone, again, this is, we're not just dropping you into a bucket and saying, there you are. It's a, it is a spectrum. Everyone has a little bit of everything, and that will be important later. So again, the object is the visual language. They want to see things. They, they, you know, they don't care as much about text. It's just they want to absorb all of the, the minutia of these things. Like art museums are this person's crack. Can I say that? I don't know. I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, so visual language, aesthetics, and they want to see. That's, that's really the idea behind an object person. And then physical. This is me. I don't know if you figured this out yet, but I, well, I, I don't know. Probably not yet. You'll figure it out later. Um, physical is all about somatic sensations, the tactile feel, and they, they want to touch things. 
So this is actually an uh, exhibit. There's actually somewhere, uh, it's, I think it's Texas. Um, I really didn't like it when I walked up to it. I really didn't. Again, I'm, I'm speaking as a physical person myself. I didn't like it when I first walked up to it until I saw the button. There's a button right underneath here. It's kind of hidden. If you press the button, that happens. I didn't care a lick about those rocks, but there was a button. <laughs> I'm going to press the button. I don't care what museum I'm in. If there is a button, I'm pressing that dang button. I'm just really going to watch myself. Uh, <laughs> there's those little flaps where it's hidden information underneath. Hey, look at that. I don't care what's under there. I just want to lift the flap. <laughs> but all of these things together, like I'm going to learn something eventually. All of uh, again, each each one of these. I, I'm not going to go back. Otherwise, I'm going to have to click forever. But um, each one of these four kind of meta categories just kind of drop people into a bucket, so that museum designers, exhibit designers, can again think: Am I catering to that person? Okay. Am I am I making sure that the idea people are satisfied at least? Are you engaging with the exhibit? Are you actually sticking around? So again, every person is slightly different. You might I'm a very physical person and then like an object person second because I'll go and I, again like this I press the button and I was like, "Oh, those rocks are pretty cool. I'm going to look at these rocks for a while." Nice. Where's another button? Uh, so again, it's, I, everyone has their own profile and it really just, you, you don't need to know it. It's just as long as you're keeping this in mind as you're designing something or creating something, you're going to have a good time. So why? Why design for experience? If you're making something that is public facing, you want as many people to like it as possible. <laughs> that is the key. Uh, if you are just designing for a very specific subset that you know this market is really good right here, then do what you want to do. But just know that what your market is. If you are just going to scattershot, poof, my product is out there, cool. What happens? Any app developers here? No? Okay. I'll get to that one. Okay. Come on. There we go. So, in this model, once you understand the four types of people, the idea people, which is, I'm gonna read everything in the museum. They're the people who go to an art museum just to read the plaques. They're like, all right, this is the, art, this is the big painting. All right, cool. Oh yeah, that's cool. The plaque. Oh, yeah. They'll just stick to the placards. You can watch. Next time you're at a museum, watch. Because you will see those people. I guarantee it. It's it's once you once you are aware of it, you can never miss it now. It's you're gonna see people that are like, wow, that painting is amazing, and just there, there's nothing here. There's nothing. I I am not a fan of art museums. Anyone know why? I can't touch anything. I see all these cool oil paintings with like these crazy textures, and there's this like ten foot barrier meant to keep me away. <laughs> I can't go. So this is the pattern that you should kind of think about. If you can attract someone with their type of experience, just get them to step up to something or engage with whatever you're doing. The second step is actually engagement. Do they stick around? <laughs> Again, if we go back to uh, my rock example, I pressed the button and it lit up those things. The light went down. And what did I do? I pressed it again. Yeah, you're late. <laughs> I pressed it again. And then, you know what? After that, I was like, OK, that's cool. And I walked off. But I stick, stuck around long enough that I wanted to press that button again, because it was going to I'm weird. I just I want to press more buttons. OK. Down to go to the next one. There we go. So the second step is engaging. So it's, again, once I've pressed the button, I want to press the button again. What's next? I want to press it again. That's engage. But flip, the flip is converting me to another 
uh, category. So yeah, I'm physical. That button converted me to an object that flipped me. Because I was like, I pressed the button and I was like, oh, that's shiny now. And now I'm, now I'm an object person for a brief point of time. And then after I'm done, I'm back to physical again. I want to press that button. So think about how you can transition in between these things. Now, again, I am not an exhibit designer. I do professional development. I teach teachers about cool stuff. So I don't have a lot of experience with exhibit design. That's just the long and the short of it. But what I do know is board games. I know board games look really, really, really well. And I just about, oh, man, I had a slide. I should have remembered that. I have it right there. I don't know why I'm not looking at it. Okay. Let's talk, talk archetypes. I love archetypes because I, I, I feel it helps you to remember exactly what the four types are because idea, people, object, physical is sometimes like, I, you know what, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So idea, the thinker. People, the butterfly. Get it? Social butterfly? I, I probably shouldn't explain it. Okay. Object, the shiny. <laughs> really hard. If you type in shiny into Google, it's, it does not come up with anything shiny. I don't know why. That was the best thing I could come up with. All right. And finally, physical, the fiddle. But no. All right. So these are the four types of, cat, of people in especially board games. And if you don't know board games all that much, bear with me. Hi, everyone watching. I, <laughs> So, idea, the thinker. These are the types of games that are super thinky. If you've ever played, sat down to play a game and you don't really like board games, and this person's like, oh no, it's great. There aren't very many rules. And they lied. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Dr. Google. No. <laughs> so these are the games with diverse options. It's the, the long-term planning. It's, but these people do not like direct player conflict. They don't like the lots of randomness that comes from, you know, Monopoly. I assume everyone's played Monopoly. And, right? It's, okay, cool. Yeah, they don't like the, the randomness of a dice throw. If you could just take dice out of games altogether and chuck them out a window. I'm a physical person. I, that's how I think. I'm sorry. I uh, chuck them out a window. They'd be happy. So. Anyone recognize any of those games? Yeah, okay. Look, look, look around, it's the two professors in the room. That, it's, it's okay, I don't want to. <laughs> these are some of my favorite games. Um, I do like these games, but again, I'm a board game geek, so I can't help it. The people idea is the high, high player interaction, the, the freedom to socialize while playing. Anyone play like bridge or even poker? Like poker, everyone at the table at least has played. Everyone at the table, what am I doing? Everyone in the room <laughs> has at some point played poker. Am I am I wrong? No, no. This is a game for the the butterfly. They love the social interaction. They love outthinking their opponent by social interaction. Any game where you can bluff, like werewolf or mafia. Yep. Th yes, these are like uh huh. Bring it on. I will lie through my teeth, and you're going to love it. <laughs> they don't like overly lengthy rules. They don't like the, ah, whatever, let's just play. How many of you play Monopoly where, uh, what happens with free parking? What? You get, you get all the money in the middle, right? Right? No, that's not in the rules. You're playing it wrong. <laughs> that extends the game by hours. <laughs> So, but don't worry about it. It's overly lengthy rules. You know how to play. Go for it. Monopoly should only take an hour and a half max, just to let you know. Okay. Everyone's like, I don't believe you. It's true. Downtime between turns. They don't really like it all that much, unless they can like talk and talk and talk. If everyone's like, I'm looking at this, they're just like, OK, come on. I just want to, let's, let's communicate. Let's do it. So these games right here, if, if, if that described you, you might like these games. The Shiny. The Shiny likes cool things. The game doesn't really matter. 
as long as it looks gorgeous and maybe miniatures, oh yes, great art presentation. Yeah, this, this is not necessary, but it's there and it makes it look really pretty. The game itself is fairly low key, but the presentation is enough to pull in a lot of the object people. They don't like generic theme. They don't like card games, generally. Just like basic, like here, war. Oh, they would they would go off of, off on a tangent, like me. Minim minimalistic games, again, just the, the smaller the game. They want to see something. They want to look at something really cool. And finally, physical, the fiddle. They like a lot of things to play with. Again, the game, secondary. Lots of physical components, tactile experience. They don't like sitting still. I think you figured this out by now. And if there's nothing to hold in their hands, they are unhappy. So Fast Track, it's a crazy little disc dexterity game where you're shooting a little disc across the, a little wooden board against the one other opponent who's also trying to do the same thing. And it's super rapid. There's, it's only your hands moving. It's great. King of Tokyo. You're rolling dice. Physical people do kind of like dice. Roll dice. There's also these little cubes which represent energy. Sometimes I just get those energy just to fiddle with them. Only one player holds the dice. I'm, hold, I'm holding those little cubes. I'm just mess, I, I'm building little things. Has anyone played Catan? Maybe? Anyone recognize these pieces at least? If you were sitting at the table, what would you do with these things? Start building things. Start building things. Nothing to do with the game. I'm going to build a tower of meeples and houses and towns. I'm going to make a little picture with my roads here. It's you are just messing with a bunch of stuff. That's all you're doing. You're just I want to I want to see what I can do and play. So okay, quick review. Thinker likes heavier stuff. Werewolf loves the social element. Again, I highly recommend these games if you're just looking for a fun little one-off thing and right there. Anyway, uh, Object, the Shiny. Does the game look pretty? If cool, yes. Mex vs. Minions is just ridiculous. It, it has like over 130 miniatures in it and you're just moving things around and you're always manipulating them all the time. It's just like, huh. But it also looks pretty, so it's physical. You get the idea. I'm definitely a fiddle, <laughs> if you hadn't figured that out. I've told you like eight times. Uh, Orleon has a bag that you actually pull stuff out of and you get to move your pieces around. It's, it's great, I love it. All right, so case study one, Catan. Just in case people haven't played Catan, I wanted to give a quick overview. So, in Catan, you, uh, it's what we call a Euro game. It uses dice, but not per player. Uh, when you roll the dice, depending on the roll of the die, certain hexagons will produce the resource that they have. So like this 10, if, you, if one player rolls a 10, whoever is yellow player is going to take a yellow resource, which is wheat. If a nine is rolled, right? Nine? Yep, nine. If a nine is rolled, this white player is gonna get a ton of resources because they have cities on it, and this yellow player is gonna just get one again. So you're building on the corners of these things, and you're trying to jockey for the best numbers. Because if you think about it, when you roll two dice, what's the highest result? It's a seven. So the closer a number is to seven, the more likely it is to get to getting rolled. So you want to get those numbers and try to avoid the other ones so that you can get the most resources. Every player will roll the dice on their turn, and by the time it rolls around to your turn, you better have enough resources to be able to build stuff. So, how does this appeal to each of the four types? Just looking at this, here's, here's another picture. Got cards, which represent the resources. Got tons of little stuff. So, yes? So, uh, the shiny has all those hexagons to look at and the cards. Yeah. The shiny has all these things. Oh, look at that, it's so pretty. All the little hexagons with all the cards. You have the cards, which are like nicely illustrated, so you can 
look at them forever. You can say, I'm going to trade you wood for sheep and say, like, I really like my sheep just because it looks like a sheep. That was going somewhere. I, I, I'll just, I'm sorry. OK, so what else? So we've, we've covered the object person. What else? People. People person. You can trade. A huge part of this game is the trading and the underselling. Oh, rock is really rare? OK, give me three wheat. <laughs> no. I'll trade you wood for sheep then. OK, fine. It's making deals. It's, it's trying to make wheel and deal as fast as you can. Because you got to make the best deals to win. Because you're going to have a lot of stuff that you want. And they have a lot of stuff they, they want. And there's a little bit of stuff that goes in between. You're like, okay, just, just one, just one. No, I want two. Uh, okay, fine. So trading is a huge element. So people, yes, cover. So people and object are done. We still need idea and physical. I gave you a hint with the physical. The dice. The dice, yeah, you have dice chucking. I'm going to go back to the, oops, up is back, up is back, up is back. I'm going to go back to this. What is, what, what's going on here? building stuff. That's a physical part. Oh. And if you if you play this game, you will just become aware of it. People who are physical people are the ones who fidget with things. They're the ones who find the, the one piece that they can play with and they just like, uh. Or alternately, they have cards and they're the ones flicking the cards. And you're like, stop it. I know because I get that a lot. All right. So physical. We have all these cool wooden bits that you can move around the board. And idea. It's the strategy. An important thing I didn't tell you, that I probably should have, is that these have to be at least two away from each other. So if that white had built there, these two orange ones couldn't have been built there. So the strategy of what is he going for and how can I stop him? That's the idea. Cool. All right, so part two. Case study number two. Sushi go. Anyone play these? OK, I feel like this is a pattern here. <laughs> One person raises their hand. Yes, OK, cool. So sushi go is a cute little card game. That's all that's in it. It's just a deck of cards. OK? On your turn, you're going to be dealt. So, uh, you're going to be dealt seven cards, I think. Seven cards, and you're going to choose one of them, just one. Put it face down in front of you. Once everyone is ready, you flip it up, and it becomes part of your sushi collection. Now you take your hand and you pass it to the left, your entire hand, and you get the person on the on your right, and now you have a new set of cards. What what do you want to build off of that? If you, if you get the most of these, so this counts as three, at the end, you're going to score a huge amount of points. And if you get second, you get a smaller amount of points, but that's still cool. Some of them, like this roll right here, just gives you two points. Just straight up, no risk, for, no reward. This one, uh, if you get three, if you, you have to get th at least three, but if you get all three, you get 10 points, which is a huge amount of points. So over the course of the game, you're going to see what all the people around the table are building. So if you see someone building two sashimis, and you're to the right of them, oh, look at that. He's got, he's got some sashimi. He's got two sashimi. I have one sashimi in my hand. I think I'm going to go for sashimi now. Because if he doesn't get three, he gets zero. Nothing. So that's better. It's in Japanese, but. You can still kind of get an idea of what it is. So let's go through all of them now. If you, uh, any, any suggestions? Idea, the thinker, the, anyone? Strategy. So we have strategy. You have the thinker. It's not a lot, but you can see he wants that. I'm taking that just so he can't have it. Ha! Yes? Pretty looking cards. You're an object person. There we go. <laughs> yeah. You like looking at, at pretty stuff. That's, that's good. So I, 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 I'm also that too. I just, I primarily will fidget with things. So 
Yeah, the, they're cute little, like, they've got faces on them, and they're cute, and they, you can look at them, and you can build a, a tableau that looks really pretty, and it's full of smiling sushi that you're about to eat. It's a little morbid, I think, but, uh, what have you. So object and, what did I say, idea? Idea. Idea and object are taken care of. What else? You got physical, the cards. Yeah, it's just, I'm gonna play with the cards, I'm gonna move them around in my hand, I'm gonna just play around with them, I, and when it gets down to only one card, I'm like, oh. But then I get a new hand of cards, ha ha. Cool. Yep. What about people? Passing the cards, swapping. Passing the cards, this has, this is pretty casual. You're just like, okay, I got it. Ah, so what's going on? Ah, you can talk, just outside of the game. You. There's, there's time to be able to converse, and kind of trash talk because, ha, I took that card and you needed it and there's nothing in this hand. Ha, <laughs> ah, sucker. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the amount of, uh, dropping a huge amount of units and risk right next to the opponent's base that you, they thought was safe. It's like, oh no, we won't attack you. No, it's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. And idea, idea, yeah, we covered everything. So a little bit of everything. Are you starting to notice a pattern? These are some really popular games. Catan is, if not the most popular, like Euro game, like the hobby board game in the world, and it's because it, it just happens to touch on a little bit of everyone's experience. This is one of the most popular card games in the world, and again, you're pretty, without even like. A lot of experience, you were like, oh yeah, finger, yeah. They, they're all about the strategy. They're tr trying to figure out, oh, how can I screw over my neighbor? People, it's like, oh, I want to converse with people. It's, ah, uh, oh, ah, oh, it's cute art, look at that. And then finally, we'll go to the case study. Constellations. So I brought this game, this is game I designed. Uh, I know a lot about it, so I can actually talk a little bit more about the design behind it. Um, so you can open the box and just, you can pass around the pieces. Um, I have pictures up here, a picture up here, but, um, so I designed this with uh, a co-designer who is a NASA scientist. He's going to, an he's not, he personally is not going to an asteroid, but one of his missions is going to an asteroid to go pick up a sample and bring it home, which is just really cool. So I, I pitched this idea of a game about building constellations and uh, it started with us like drawing. We had a grid, kind of like a. Remember those uh, rubber band boards when you were in elementary school where you're building shapes, right? Oh, if I, I'm seeing the adults nod. Am I really? I'm not that. I'm not that old. <laughs> Anyone remember those? Okay, one. Okay, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Making me feel a little bit better. So you have these little dots, uh, like little raised pegs, and you'd be able to like put a rubber band around here and then like here and here and you'd have a triangle. It's for young kids to learn their sh basic shapes and actually be able to manipulate something. Physical experience. So we were thinking, oh man, we could do something like this where they're actually building constellations with the lines in between. That would be so cool. It's really expensive to manufacture these things if you're doing a small print run. So that went out the door. Then we kind of did a couple other things, and uh, we had cards that would be on the table, and you'd overlay them kind of oddly, and they had dots on them, and then you had to connect them with the roads, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it just didn't work. So finally, we came up with a whole other idea where you're using the stellar types of stars, uh, and they're the different colors. These are the actual letters that astronomers use to classify the different spectral types of stars. And the B type stars, the A type stars, the F type stars, the K type stars, the M type stars. So there is rarity in here, but we don't tell anybody about that. There are certain cards that come out more commonly, but we didn't actually tell anyone <laughs> that that's how it worked. Just by playing the game, you'll start to learn. And who has the deck of cards right now? It's somewhere in here. Okay, just sift through that deck really quickly, and which one of those is the most common. And I'll, while that's going, I'll just, I'll come back to you. The one star A? 
So A, A's and B's are actually the most common stars in the sky. And you'll find them the most on these constellations. These stars are the actual makeup of the stars in the constellations. If you look at the hexes right here, on the back of these things, you'll find the actual constellations with a stylized picture by an amazing artist, Ashley. She's amazing. Um, each one of the stars is the actual color of the star in the night sky. So if you pointed a telescope at that star, it would look that color. Did we have to do that? No. No. Honestly, you, we could have gotten away with this. And that's it. But we wanted people to learn, darn it. We had an extra goal on top of experience. So the whole point of the game is you're collecting these star cards. Every star card has a little fact on the bottom. Again, completely irrelevant to the game. But we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it has a number, and some, some, uh, some cards actually have like two, two stars on them, just to kind of forward it. Because again, B-type stars, there's a lot of them. A lot of them. So we had to double up on some of them. But let's go into how each of the four categories fits into this. Now that you've heard a little bit of background. If I hadn't told you all that cool stuff about the game, would have idea been as cool? Would they have thought about this as cool? Not as much. The idea type person, this game is not for them. Unless they try to find the, hit, the Easter eggs we hid in there. Like the fact that the deck is literally made up of the exact percentage, well, plus or minus 1% of the actual percentage of stars in the night sky. Not in the rules. It's just there. It's there for people to find. And now everyone knows. Sorry, world. Uh, the second thing is these gems. When you play a constellation, you get a bunch of points right away. You'll discard all the types of stars that you're, you're playing. You'll get those points. If you play adjacent to any one of these named constellations, you get bonus points. And again, these are the actual constellations that this one is next to. You'll get more bonus points. And then for every gem that you match along the outside edge of this to the main board, you'll get even more points. So if I put, let's see if I can find something here. This, this one right here, and I flipped it this way, so this purple would not line up with this blue. This yellow would line up with that yellow. This purple would not line up with that, but this blue would line up with that. So I get two bonus points. I land up two gems, I get bonus points. This will actually, the system actually creates a fairly accurate map of the night sky when you play it. There is a whole zodiac band of constellations that goes completely across. And let's see if I can find it here. Yep, so zodiac, 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 uh, and then somehow it's jumped down here. But yeah, zodiac, zodiac, zodiac. There's always at least one of those lines. Every game. It's, it's delightful. Just to see people posting pictures of it, and it's like, there it is, huh? These red, these red gems mean north, northern sky. This yellow gem means zodiac, Milky Way, and southern. And so every side has an input and an output. This is what it is. This is what it wants next to it. And so if you rotate it upside down, it reverses the direction so they match up, kind of like the prongs in an outlet. And so by that, you'll actually see Two yellows mean that it's a, it's a zodiac and it wants a zodiac next to it. So you create a line. And likewise, you have a zodiac that wants a northern constellation next to it. What's next to it? Northern constellation. Again, this didn't was not in the rules. It didn't need to be. It's for people, the idea of people to discover. Did I mean to do that? No, but it was really cool that it did. <laughs> No, oh, no, no, go back, go back, stop. Okay, so that's idea people. What about the other ones? How about butterfly? Probably should explain more about the game before I go into that. These cards constantly cycle. You can take from here, or you can take from the top of the deck. One of the actions is also, I'm gonna reserve this so no one else can build it but me. 
I gave you a hint, that's the people, people. So looking at what other people are building and stopping them. And they're like, ha ha, got you. It's the intermittent banter. It allows you to converse. It's not a very high energy game. It's like, oh, okay, play Constellation, woo. How you doing, Bob? Pretty good. You can actually talk again. Again, the goal is to get back people back talking together and actually interacting on a physical space, not this nonsense. It's, it's not nonsense, I understand. It's, it's not nonsense, but we do need physical interaction. Idea, people, object. Does Constellation illustrate that? Yeah. It's pretty. <laughs> it's, it's really, like, you, at the end of the game, you've created a map of the night sky. I mean, that was a big part of why I wanted to design this game, was for that visual. And I'm really glad it came out. And then finally, physical. You're holding cards. You're looking through them. The, the constellations themselves have glow-in-the-dark stars on them, so you actually can feel the back of them. And it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. Good texture. So how does this apply to you? Again, most of you said, ah, I don't really design games. That's fine. What do you design? What do you make? What do you hear? What are you here to do? <laughs> Y'all are students. You should probably be able to answer this question. Yes? I don't know what you're doing. Well, we'll just keep the camera up here so his parents don't see it. <laughs> Anyone kind of know what they want to do? I'm seeing it. You volunteered, you nodded. I'm sorry. Hi, um, well, I'm a cybersecurity major. Okay. So I'm um, looking into pen testing uh, or programming. Okay. So how, can, how would that apply? How, how would this method apply to all of the various pieces? To all of the, vari the four types? Okay. It's slightly different in your regard because of the field you're going into. Who's the end user of what you're doing? Uh, person on a computer. Maybe. A person on a computer, yeah. So, each again, each person has a preferred experience that they want to kind of interact with. How can you design a program for a people person? It's a good question. Right? It's a really good question. It's a really good question <laughs> because, question like, answer. this dummy, like, <laughs> if I look at code, I'm going to be like, all right. But how do you design for a different experience type? You just have to make it <clears throat> easy to use and lots of uh, like graphic user interfaces that are right. easy to work with. So, so GUIs. I, I love that. Yeah. That's when I, I learned that. that I, was, I, I wasn't into that. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's mine. You should get used to saying it because it is the best feeling to just say, yeah, I'm a programmer. I work on GUIs. What? <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't do that. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when you're working with a graphic user interface, you have to assume that the person on the other end is someone from the public that might not know what you're talking about. So, how do you engage them in a way? Like, I like clicking stuff, so do you have things built in that allow me to click around and kind of mess with things without hurting too much? <laughs> Speak from experience. Uh, do you have... The object, the, the, like you said, the graphic user, user interface that you can see and look and say, wow, that's pretty cool. I know how to get around here. Has anyone downloaded a really crappy app that they're like, I don't know what's going on here? They were not taking into account the people people. <laughs> that there is another person on the other side that would like to have some sort of conversation with you, even if it's clicking on a button. If they don't know, I need to click on this button, they're not going to. OK, cool. That's Kind of programmers. Okay, I'm just I'm, unless someone volunteers, I'm just going to point at someone. You're going to tell me your major. <laughs> really going to have yes. Engineering. Engineering. Oh, I mean that's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, engineering is it, it, it's basically experience design at its core. Like, how do you get people to come over and interact with your product? I mean, that's why Apple has made such a huge name for itself. They're engineers that also happen to understand at the core how to attract users to their product. Once they've attracted the users to their product, 
hey, I'm going to try engaging. And now look at where we are. We got out of flip phones, and now we're, uh, ah, do you want to be there? <laughs> I'm good at improv, I swear. All right. So that goes for pretty much anything in engineering. Without, you can be a great engineer, but you should also keep in the back of your mind to design for this experience. You are trying to, there are lots of different people in the world, and if they can't interact with your product, it's out the window. That's just kind of how society works now. If it doesn't work, eh, it's broke. It's a little sad, but I mean, it, by thinking about this, we actually prevent that. We encourage reuse and recycling of our old phones, per se. How many people have seen a flip phone in the last year? Who owns a flip phone in the past year? Keep your hands up. There we go. You all saw his phone, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the, Aaron is the uh, eponymous Dr. Witz. He invited me. I just want to thank him for letting me come. I'm not done yet, but I just thank you very much. This is this is a fantastic experience. I love I love getting in front of a classroom like this. I don't get to do it very often, and it's really exciting when I do. I get to talk about cool things that I like. Cool. So uh, anyone else? Okay, I'm done. What do you do? Chemistry. Chemistry. So in chemistry, how are you getting people to engage, uh, attract you to the product that you're making? Colors. Always do things with colors. Always do things with colors. People like to see <laughs> things change color and explode. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Liquid nitrogen, two liter bottle, drop in a trash bag of popcorn. It's great. That's not color change. I don't know what I meant. <laughs> Something cool that you can Attract them with. Color change. Pretty much any physical, any chemical change is going to exhibit something cool. So that's how you get them. How do you get them to stay? Usually if it's cool enough, they usually stay. It's hard. Yeah. No, that's, again, that's, most people are not the idea that they don't really care about the things behind it. So how do you get them to this point? Well, you have to keep them <laughs> engaged long enough to actually be interested in it. Teachers of the world do this every day because pretty much every one of their kids asks the question, when am I ever going to need this? <laughs> the teachers all just went, yup. <laughs> How many of you are guilty of saying that at least once in your life? Uh-huh. But I mean, that means that, <laughs> what does that mean though? That means that your preferred experience was not catered to. It means that if a teacher had approached it in, this, in a different manner and maybe shown you something really cool before just diving into the, the ideas behind it, you might have actually engaged long enough to be able to be interested enough to learn. Uh-huh, 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 cool. Okay. And that is actually the end of my presentation right now. Does anyone have any questions? Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you for coming to the